with that, we'll move on to uh, the Songs Mitigation Program and uh, discuss the work program associated with that. Welcome, Susan Hanch. Good afternoon, Commissioners. We're here before you today for the Coastal Commission's consideration and recommended approval of the two-year independent, the two-year work program and budget for the independent monitoring program for the Marine Mitigation Program to address impacts from the San Onofre Nuclear Generating Station, also known as SONGS. Dr. Kate Hucklebridge of the Commission staff and Dr. Steve Schroeder, one of the independent scientists um, working on this oversight program will be giving the staff presentation. But today I really wanted to highlight for you the importance of the Commission's long-term commitment to the need for scientific studies and oversight independent of the applicant on a very large project. This has been going on since the beginning in 1974. And while the science has been done independently, it has been funded through Edison and by Edison. But they are not in direct control of how the science has been done. Um, I've personally been involved in this through much of my career at the Coastal Commission, and this commission will continue to be involved for the, the mitigation is required for the entire operating life of the SONGS project. So even though all the mitigation is in play now, it's not meeting all the performance standards yet. So even when the plants close, the commission is gonna have long-term oversight to make sure the mitigation actually is implemented and implemented correctly, meeting those performance standards. So I just wanted to uh, pinpoint and uh, highlight for you the importance of that independence um, of scientific review, and it's been going on since 1974. So it's a very important um, history that the commission has and a commitment to the independent science. So I'd like to have uh, Kate Hucklebridge begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, as Susan mentioned, the next item, 6C, is the work plan and budget for the SONGS Mitigation Monitoring Program for 2016 and 2017. Uh, before I get to the work plan and budget, um, I, along with my colleague, Dr. Steve Schroeder from the University of Santa Barbara, would like to take a few minutes to give you some background on the program, as well as a status update on the mitigation projects. Next slide, please. The SONGS Mitigation Program is one of the Commission's, if not the longest, running projects. It began in 1974 when the California Coastal Zone Conservation Commission, the predecessor to the Coastal Commission, approved a permit for the construction of the operation of Units 2 and 3, the San Onofre Power Plant. At the time the permit was issued, the magnitude of the impacts to the marine environment from operation of these nuclear power generators, and specifically the cooling water system, was not well understood. And so, the permit included a condition that required a comprehensive impact study and it created a dedicated independent scientific body called the Marine Review Committee to conduct that study. The Marine Review Committee collected data on kelp, invertebrates, fish, water quality, and physical ocean parameters before and then after Units 2 and 3 came online in 1983. The before and after data were compared to determine the actual marine impacts associated with the operation of songs. Next slide, please. Based on these studies conducted by the Marine Review Committee, the Commission concluded that the Song's cooling water system, which pumped approximately 2.4 billion gallons of ocean water per day, had two principal types of adverse impacts to the marine environment. First, the two intake pipes, which you can see here on the upper left corner of the slide, entrained and killed all immature stages of fish, resulting in substantial losses of nearshore fish in Southern California. Second, the discharges from units two and three created warm and turbid plumes that had substantial adverse impacts on giant kelp and associated fish and invertebrates, especially at the San Onofre kelp forest, which you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. Next slide, please. The commission determined that the adverse marine impacts caused by SONGS operations could be adequately compensated for by a mitigation package that included four conditions. The first condition required Southern California Edison to create a tidal wetland to provide out-of-kind mitigation for losses of immature fish entrained in the intakes. The second condition 
required Edison to maintain and install devices called behavioral barriers that encourage fish to swim away from the intake openings, thus reducing fish losses due to impingement. The third condition required Edison to construct a kelp reef to mitigate for losses of kelp, fish, and invertebrates at the San Onofre kelp forest. And finally, the fourth condition set up the administrative structure of a monitoring program independent of Edison to evaluate the success of these mitigation projects. These conditions were incorporated into the Songs Permit through an amendment in 1991, which officially kicked off the beginning of the Songs Mitigation Monitoring Program. These conditions were then modified in 1997, partway through the mitigation planning process. As Susan mentioned in her introduction, one of the cornerstones of the Song's mitigation monitoring program from its inception has been its independence from the applicant and its partners, ensuring that the mitigation is evaluated by a qualified independent entity with no vested interest in the results. To that end, a team of scientists from UC Santa Barbara, led by three project managers, Dr. Steve Schroeder, Dr. Dan Reed, and Dr. Mark Page, who are all here today, were selected to conduct the monitoring for the reef and wetland. A science advisory panel consisting of three University of California professors, Dr. Rich Ambrose of UCLA, Dr. Rush Schmidt of UC Santa Barbara, and Dr. Pete Ramundi of UC Santa Cruz, provide scientific oversight and guidance to staff and the monitoring team. The entire program is funded by Edison through a series of two-year work programs and budgets like the one before you today. Another key component of the Songs Mitigation Monitoring Program are the annual public workshops that are held each spring to share monitoring and compliance results with the public. The annual monitoring has several goals. The first goal is to determine if the mitigation project has it been installed according to the approved plans. Once a constructed project is accepted, monitoring activities shift slightly to assess whether the project is meeting the performance standards included in the permit. If performance standards are not being met, the monitoring team analyzes all available data to determine the cause of any failures and recommend appropriate remediation to bring the, the project back into compliance. Based in part on analysis and scientific review provided by the UCSB monitoring team and SAP during the design phase, the commission issued a CDP for the kelp reef in 1999. That same year, Edison constructed the first phase, an experimental reef, to test various reef designs. The full mitigation reef was constructed in 2008, and performance monitoring of the reef began that same year. The planning and design phase for the wetland took a little longer, with the CDP for the wetland being issued in 2005. <coughs> wetland construction was completed in 2011, with performance monitoring again beginning later that year. Now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Steve Schroeder, one of the UC Santa Barbara project managers, to provide a brief overview of compliance monitoring results to date for both the wetland and the reef. I uh, start with the first slide, which has to do with uh, condition A, the wetland mitigation. The site for the mitigation is um, at the San Diego Lagoon uh, wetlands. Um, and this uh, aerial photograph was taken in 2003 before excavation and grading of the wetlands. Um, the site is bisected by the I-5 freeway. The San Diego River runs through it. And um, it consisted of ruderal or weedy uplands, old ag fields, and a World War II uh, dirigible airfield. This um, slide was taken last year um, after the excavation and grading was completed. And approximately 2.2 million cubic yards of dirt were excavated to create this tidal wetland, and it resulted in the creation of intertidal salt marsh habitat, mudflat habitat, um, subtidal channels, and a large subtidal basin um, west of the freeway. Um, the, dis the disposal sites here uh, took the, uh, the, the, the um, 
excavated material. And then there's one feature is these large berms that occur. Um, and they are designed to prevent the wetland from being destroyed during uh, extreme storm events. There are also four nesting sites for the California endangered California lease turn. Um, this is a part of the permit for the 22nd Ag District, and we are, we're not monitoring that, but it's part of the uh, overall project. Um, during the later stages of construction and very soon after um, the construction was completed, the wetland was colonized by a host of invertebrates, uh, fish, and birds. <coughs> And um, unexpectedly, also by eelgrass, um, it wasn't part of the original design. Eelgrass is a very important habitat for uh, marine fish. And eelgrass has taken off and has spread throughout the, the uh, wetlands so far. This slide lists the performance standards by which we um, monitor the performance of the restoration project. There are two kinds of performance standards. There are absolute performance standards that are measured against fixed values at the San Diego wetland only. And these range from habitat areas, tidal prism, which has to do with um, tidal flushing, topography, whether, whether the project um, has maintained its design. And then there are an additional um, 11 um, relative standards. And these relative standards are measured against three reference, natural reference wetlands in the Southern California area. And the, the point of these relative standards is to determine whether the wetland mitigation is acting similar to the natural wetlands. And the, uh, the relative standards include a standard for water quality, which largely is concerned with dissolved oxygen, and standards for the total abundance and species richness of birds, fish, and invertebrates. Um, the cover of vegetation, including salt marsh vegetation and algae, and then this thing called Spartina canopy architecture. And this is Spartina or cordgrass uh, shown down here. And Spartina is an important um, nesting habitat for the endangered light-footed clapper rail or ridgeway rail. And finally, there's a, a food chain support standard which we measure by looking at the density of feeding birds to see whether the wetland is providing food chain support for the uh, biota. This is a summary so far. So, so far we have monitored post-construction three years. Um, and uh, during the first year, the habitat area standard was not met um, and the relative standards were met, but in 2013 and 2014, all of the standards but the habitat area standard have been met. Um, sorry. Um, one of the reasons the habitat st area standard has been not been met, an important component of this, is the development of salt marsh vegetation. Um, salt marsh vegetation has um, colonized well in some areas, but there were uh, certain fairly large areas, particularly west of the freeway, where it has underperformed. Um, our independent monitoring determined that um, the reason for this was that it was very high intertidal habitat, got rarely inundated by the tides, and it was very flat, and so the drainage was poor, and as a result, um, soil salinities were extremely high and essentially created salt flats. Um, based on the results of our monitoring, <clears throat> Edison uh, has regraded this area. They finished it last year. Um, they've lowered it and they have um, sloped it so that it drains. And I'm happy to report that as a result of this uh, change, um, salt marsh vegetation has started to colonize and so we're very um, optimistic that this is going to um, redound well to the uh, habitat uh, area standard in the future. Next, I want to turn to the um, condition C, the kelp reef mitigation. Um, the kelp reef is located south of the San Clemente Pier between San Clemente and San, San Mateo Point, shown here in the um, yellow rectangle. Um, also shown on this graph are two, the two reference sites that we use to compare um, the mitigation reef to. 
Um, the San Mateo kelp just south of the reef and the barn kelp about 12 and a half kilometers to the south. Um, as Kate pointed out, the kelp reef mitigation was done in two phases. The first phase was an experimental reef. It was short term um, and uh, lasted for five years, small scale. Actually, it's a fairly large reef, but it's 24 acres, about 24 acres. And the purpose of the experimental phase was to test a range of different reef designs. The second phase called the mitigation phase, oh, and so I don't know if you can see it, but the, the experimental phase are these pink squares that are kind of scattered uh, north to south. The second phase is the mitigation phase. It's long term for the operating uh, life of uh, the power plant. It's large scale. Um, there were an additional 152 acres added in um, 2008, and the aim of this is to compensate for the resources lost to the songs. And so the added 152 <coughs> acres are shown in green here. The information that we gained from our monitoring of the experimental reef was used to design the mitigation reef. These are the 15 performance standards that we use to judge um, uh, the reef, uh, which was uh, christened the Wheeler North Reef. Um, there are four absolute standards against, again, measured only at uh, the Wheeler North Reef um, against fixed values, including the amount of hard substrate, uh, uh, area of giant kelp, fish standing stock, and whether or not invasive or undesirable species are abundant and having an adverse effect on the, on the community. And then the um, 11 uh, relative standards are measured against the two reference or uh, natural reference reefs and they uh, are concerned with the total abundance and species richness of the algae, invertebrates, um, and fish. Um, standards five through nine deal with what we call the benthos, the things that live on the bottom, and 10 through 14 have to do with um, uh, kelp bed fish. Um, like the, like the uh, wetland mitigation, there is a standard for food chain support, and we measure this uh, by uh, fish feeding, um, and it gives us an indication of how well the reef provides <clears throat> um, support for fish uh, growth and reproduction and, and production. Um, Within about two years of the construction, um, kelp it recruited like gangbusters on the reef. And this is a Landsat photo taken from 438 miles out in space. The red is false color and shows the kelp canopy. Wheeler North Reef is area is in, outlined in yellow. And you can see that there's a, a, a very substantial kelp canopy. San Mateo, one of the reference reefs is to the south, and the San Onofre kelp is the site of the impact and the power plant is here, songs. And so far, um, kelp has done uh, very well on this reef. Um, the Wheeler North Reef currently supports populations of algae, invertebrates, and fish that are similar to the natural reference reefs. And one of these algae are the giant kelp, which is called a foundation species because it provides important habitat. Um, and food for um, the biota in the kelp forest. One of the standards that has not been met to date is the fish standing stock. And the permit requires that the standing stock of fish at the mitigation reef shall be at least 28 U.S. tons. Um, this slide shows a time series from the beginning of the monitoring the green uh, triangles are actually data that we have collected through 2014. The open triangle is um, preliminary data. Um, we're not through the monitoring yet. Um, and so fish standing stock went from a low of about six um, tons and in 2014 to a high of about 25 and a half tons. And given this big increase, you know, the thought was, well, maybe it's, you know, going toward the, the standard. However, and this was during last year when there was anomalously warm water, the blob, 
Um, and we have speculated as to why, you know, we got a big influx or increase in fish standing stock. But then it's, it's gone down. And so overall, um, it looks like over the seven years of monitoring, uh, the fish standing stock has not been met, and it doesn't look like it's going to be met in uh, the future. So this is a, an issue that we, have, that we are dealing with. Um, fish standing stock is dependent in part on the size of the reef, its topography, and rock coverage, the percent cover of hard substrate on the bottom. And the, these, this is a boulder reef, and it mimics the San Onofre kelp bed, which uh, is also a boulder reef, the site of the impact. The Wheeler North Reef is currently at about 174 acres, consisting of low relief rock, which is less than three feet off of the bottom, um, with an average coverage of 48 percent. Question we have asked using data that we've gathered since 2000 um, from the experimental through the um, performance monitoring stage is, is 48 percent coverage of low relief rock sufficient to sustain 28 fish over the long term? And we've, over the last couple of years, we have done extensive analyses in conjunction with our science advisory panel. And the conclusion that we have come to is that is that, oh, no, it's not. It's simply not big enough to sustain uh, 28 tons over the long term. And so this brings up the issue of remediation to address this um, problem. Um, this is a summary of the mitigation credit for the Wheeler North Reef from 2009 through 2014. So in the early first three years, it did not meet the fish standing stock. Actually, it hasn't met them in any of, of the years so far. And for the first three years, it didn't meet the relative standards. But since 2012, it has met all of the standards except for uh, the fish standing stock standard. And this concludes my remarks. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Schroeder. Uh, the purpose of today's hearing is to ask the Commission vote to approve the funding for 2016-2017 work uh, to, be, to continue the independent monitoring of the Song's mitigation program. This work plan and budget is very similar to the last several work plans and budgets with only a few noticeable changes. For the reef, uh, the monitoring task to be completed in 2016 and 2017 will continue with collection and analysis of monitoring data to determine compliance with performance standards. In addition, to address the shortfall in, in fish biomass at the reef described by Dr. Schroeder, staff, uh, the UCSB project managers, and the SAP have been working with Edison to determine appropriate remediation. We will continue with analysis and planning for reef remediation under a dedicated task in the 2016-2017 work plan. Our intent is to bring a remediation plan in front of you sometime next year. Uh, for the wetland, performance monitoring will continue as it has for the past few years. In addition, the Song's permit includes a special requirement for the wetland that the biological standards be evaluated after uh, four years after construction is completed. So after this next year, which is the fourth year of monitoring, in addition to the regular compliance monitoring, staff, the UCSB monitoring team, and the, and the SAP will pay special attention to the wetlands performance with respect to these biological standards to determine if any remedial action is necessary at the wetland. Before the staff report was finalized, staff had an opportunity to discuss the draft work plan and budget with Edison staff and was able to address their questions and concerns. Thus, as indicated in the support letter included in the appendix to the staff report, Edison is in agreement with the tasks and budget outlined in the 2016-2017 work plan and budget. The motion and resolution for this item can be found on page four of the staff report. If you would like any additional information on the Songs Mitigation Monitoring Program, uh, you can visit the UCSB website listed at the bottom of the slide. Uh, and with that, that concludes staff's presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we do have one speaker card from David Asty. Invite David up um, and ask how much time you'd like. He represents Southern California Edison. Good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, just a minute. I just want to okay. touch on just very Thank quickly you. on four Great. quick Come points. Uh, again, I'm David Asty with Southern California Edison. SE, as we stated, has worked uh, closely with the staff on this work program and the budget for the Marine Mitigation Program. We are, of course, fully committed to completion of this work. We do truly appreciate 
the staff's collaborative mindset on this particular effort. And we're in complete agreement with the budget and the staff recommendation and uh, recommend that you approve. And thank you very much for this opportunity to comment. Thank you. No other public speaker cards. Uh, I'll turn to uh, Commissioner Cox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would uh, move that the commission approve the 2016 and 2017 two-year songs work program and budget and contingency fund as recommended by the staff, and I would recommend a yes vote. Thank you. Uh, would you like to speak to your motion? No, it's very, very good, very comprehensive report. I appreciate the staff's work with this uh, and also with uh, Southern California Edison. Thank you. And to your second? Okay. Any other uh, commissioner comments? Okay. Uh, ex partes on the songs mitigation program? Yeah, I, I thought about it and I realized intuitively nobody would have done that. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm happy to check and verify my intuition here. Great. Thank you. Um, that having been said, we have a motion and second. Any unwillingness for unanimous yes vote? Seeing none, then we do approve this mitigation program and are, and are excited to see the progress that's being made. Thank you. Thank you.